come along to this full council meeting. Um, I'll just open with Karakia, Kia Tau Mai Te Maru Matanga, Kia Tau Mai Te Rangi Marie, Kia Tau Mai Te Kaha me te Aroha, mō tēnei kaupapa, hui e, tai ki e. Uh, we have apologies from Deputy Mayor Bryant, Councillor Walker and Councillor Shellcrest. Can someone please move the apologies? Uh, move Councillor Hill, second and Councillor Dowler. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Uh, we have two people registered to speak in the public forum. So we have Marion Sadley uh, and Matthias Schaffner. Uh, so I'll just take them in that order. Uh, so Marion... Marion, you're first. I just realised that my speech falling out of my car and it's a Oh. <laughs> Would you like to reschedule for a later date? Yeah. Okay. No, no worries. Uh, Matthias, over to you. So, and um, speaking as part of a, on behalf of an organisation, you have 10 minutes. So I will hand over to you and I will give you a nod at nine-ish if, if you're still uh, speaking at that point. Okay. Um, good morning, Mr. Mayor. I would like to talk about the initial proposal for representation re review that's on your agenda today. Uh, in there, under point 49, we can read, quote, the council undertook preliminary engagement seeking general feedback from the community on representation arrangements. Only 16 respondents were, uh, responses were received, meaning that the sample size is too small to give a true analysis of ratepayers and residents' views. Uh, quote, and our organization, Tasman Democracy, we provided feedback. We shared our view. But because only 15 other people or groups shared their view, council is not considering our view as important because the sample size was too small. Such a statement makes no sense and we would like to see that council shows a lot more respect towards the people and groups that take the time and make the effort to provide feedback. I can only speak for our organization that we spend a substantial amount of time on this. We did a lot of background research, reading legislation, reading the determination from the local government commission from the last review. We even read an academic discussion paper, 52 pages, about the concept of community of interest as it applies to local government boundaries. We took the effort and the result was four full pages submitted, including tables and calculations. We even got feedback from elected members, for example, quote, thank you for a well thought out and articulated submission. Or another one, quote, thank you for taking the time and making the effort. Your submission is very comprehensive regarding the future representation of elected members, quote, and Please don't get me wrong, you don't have to agree with the feedback that we provide, not at all. That's up for debate. I like debate. I would, uh, would like to see a lot more debate in this room. But, and, 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 and also, I, I have no problem with, with all of you disagreeing with my arguments, and if there are good arguments on the table, right? Uh, that's not the problem. But I do have a problem with the statement that the sample size is too small. And because of that, because of that, council cannot give true consideration to the feedback that was submitted. I do have a problem with that because it defeats the purpose of public participation. For public participation, it doesn't matter if 16 people share their view or 16,000, because I cannot force other people to share their view. I can only share mine. Another part of this report that's on the agenda this speaks about, quote, the council also noted that the residents had a high level of familiarity with the current ward system, which has not, which has been in place for multiple cycles. Quote, and that's not relevant for the representation review. The purpose of the review is to come up with the best solution for the future and not what people are, were familiar with in the past. Uh, just being familiar with a certain setup doesn't mean one is happy about this, or in this context here, it doesn't mean that the representation is fair and effective. We can even read in your report, quote, the primary objective of the review is to ensure fair and effective representation for individuals and communities. That's absolutely right. That's the purpose of the review, but then why is the analysis in the report not based on that premise, fair and effective, but instead it talks about what people are familiar with or not. But we can go into the details. Uh, the Golden Bay Ward does not comply with the 
fair representation requirement. That, that's accepted because of its geographic separation from the rest. It's an isolated community. That's fair. I have absolutely no problem with that. But I do have a problem with the proposed representation in the Mutri Waimea ward. Not only because I live in there, but because all the 15,000 people in there are heavily underrepresented. And that got worse compared to the last review. And then in the proposal, also the Richmond ward does not comply with the 10% rule anymore. 20,000 people in Richmond are now also underrepresented. So if you add up all these numbers in your report, you can see that 71% of the people are either under or overrepresented with this proposal that we see today. Only 29% of people would get a fair representation in the next election. So how can this be possibly be possibly called a fair and effective representation when only 29% of people actually get the fair representation? The report also uh, states that consideration was given to other options that we can see in the report, for example, changing the boundaries or only having three wards instead of five. But what's extremely frustrating for me sitting here is that all the alternative options, you cannot see the option that there are four wards, for example. But we suggested this. Our group suggested to have four wards. And we think the idea is really simple. There is this Muturi Waimea ward, which already has, for some reason, a double name. How about we just split this into a, a Muturi part? which is merged to Motoreka, and uh, Waimea part that is then merged into Richmond. And what's the effect of this? The effect is that all wards would have a fair representation, except the Golden Bay ward that's unique that we, uh, we spoke about this. So with our proposal, 90% of the people would get a fair representation, uh, representation in the next election. Compare this with the 29% uh, what staff suggested. And, and the, the question now is, can you actually do this? Can you split the Muturi Waimea ward? Um, or is it because of some rural versus um, urban living arrangements compared to Richmond and Motueka? Let me read a bit for, uh, from the text that we submitted as feedback. Quote, the difference in living situation is not a primary factor when establishing ward boundaries. More important are aspects how infrastructure and facilities are used in certain areas, regardless of the urban rural boundary. It would appear logical that people living in Wakefield Brightwater gravitate more towards Richmond, where residents in Mapua and Upper Motori gravitate more towards Motueka. This includes working arrangements, shopping locations, social activities, and the use of administrative and recreational facilities. And we even provided, uh, I think, a really good example. There are four Tasman District libraries, the Richmond Library in Richmond, Motueka Library in Motueka, Takaka Library in Golden Bay, and the Murchison Library in uh, Murchison. There's no library in the Muturi uh, Waimea ward. Instead, the people in Muturi, they go to Motueka, and the people in, um, in, uh, uh, in Waimea, they go to the Richmond Library. And Mr. Mayor, last but not least, I would like to illustrate the absurdity of the current situation. I live personally in Upmutri, but I'm not allowed to, uh, to contact any councillor in my ward via email. Not Councillor McKenzie, not Councillor Kinimoth, and not Councillor Shellcress. But instead, from the Mutueka ward, Councillor Walker and Councillor Maru expressed their willingness that they would like to get my emails. You, Councillor McKinsey, you didn't do this. Seems that you're not interested in receiving my emails and listening to my concerns. And that's absolutely not criticizing you, not at all. It just reflects reality. You are in Wakefield, is it right? So you care about people in Wakefield and Brightford, and that's fine, that's okay. But I live in Upper Motory. And the councillors that care about my concerns, that are the ones from Motoreka, Councillor Maru and Councillor Walker. And this is just a perfect example why this current Muturi Waimea setup makes no sense. There are two completely distinct community that almost have nothing in common. And finally, when, when you all make a decision on this today, later in the meeting, I hope that you all uphold your oath of office, which states to act in the best interest of your community. Because I cannot see how it would be in the best interest of the community if the majority of people don't get a fair representation in the next election. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. 
Right, we will now move on to the uh, next item, so declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest in relation to anything in today's meeting? No, thank you. We have a number of sets of minutes to be confirmed. Uh, firstly, the Tasman District Council meeting on the 20th of June. Someone moved, they were a for a correct record, moved uh, Councillor McKenzie, seconded Councillor Mailing. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Right. Yanks carried the 27th of June. Uh, Councillor Dakey, seconded Councillor Kinnamont. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. The confidential minutes from the 20th of June. Uh, moved Councillor Dakey, seconded uh, Councillor Dowler. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And it's carried. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the presentation from Waimea Water. Oh, not here yet. We must be ahead of time. Uh, well, we are, actually. Um, Mike, do you want to do the statement of intent now, or do you want to wait till after Waimea Water's presentation? We'll probably need to wait till after. Uh, local government funding agency. Mike. Uh, so this is item 7.3, page 41. Over to you, Mike. Through Mr. Mayor, uh, this is a routine report uh, back to Council on the final statement of intent for the LGFA. There are no particular matters I wish to bring to your attention. I'll take the report as read and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, it is open for comments, feedback or questions. Or moving and seconding its receipt. Thank you through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Look, I'm happy to to move it. I think we've been through the draft of the um, SOI, um, so I'm happy to move the resolution. Yeah. Um, Mike, when I read through this, I saw that uh, looks like this first year is a slightly reduced level of lending, but then they expect it to increase going forward. Um, and there seems to be a lot more use being made of the local government funding agency, particularly by um, CCOs. Would that be a fair comment? Uh, so, you know, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. As most um, council CCOs um, that take advantage of the lower borrowing costs through uh, the LGFA, uh, that's evident in the lending. But also, as councils as a whole, um, like this council, have increased. Uh, their borrowing and certainly out through their long-term plans is a clear indication of significantly increased borrowing. Uh, that borrowing will go through the LGFA in most cases. Uh, the only exception is typically Auckland. There is a limit on how much Auckland can borrow through the LGFA so it doesn't dominate the LGFA um, program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Greening. Uh, I had my hand up to move it, but if it hasn't been seconded, I'm happy to second it. Uh, yeah, happy for you to second it. Uh, do you have any questions? Don't, that's all good. Uh, any further comment? So it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Mackenzie and Greening, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Um. So the next item we will do is the remits to um, LGNZ. So thank you for everyone's helpful feedback. Uh, so the resolution now reflects the feedback that we've had both in terms of um, priority and support, uh, noting that this is obviously the, um, the decision that ultimately the uh, council representative at the meeting will then exercise the council's vote on each of these remits as they come up at the AGM. So, uh, oh, in terms of the, so at the moment, I think they can all be support. Yeah. So the feedback was that um, the council supports each of the resolutions and they are in, 
and then that reflects the priorities. So I'll read out the priorities. So the first priority was the appropriate funding model for central government initiatives. The second priority was the um, use or return through some mechanism or another of goods and services tax. The third priority is local government wards um, and, and referendums. The fourth was the entrenchment of Maori seats. The fourth was the graduated driver's licensing system fee structure. The sixth was representation review information provision. The seventh was the community services card identification. And the oh, seventh equal the proactive lever to mitigate the deterioration of unoccupied buildings. So it is open for conversation, discussion, and or moving and seconding. And I'll start with Councillor Greening and then Councillor McKenzie. Yeah, so um, I circulated uh, my rankings uh, to the wider group, but I, I never saw anyone else's. Uh, and I haven't seen um, the consolidated picture. So it would be useful to know um, how the final uh, numbers uh, were grouped up. And it would have been useful to have it circulated before this meeting. Um, but um, I indicated, uh, while in agreement with the first priority, I think there are some in there that um, seem a little bit pointless of uh, LGNZ who have stretched resources and no doubt if they have to resource us, we'll be coming to council for more funding. Um, uh, wanted some clarity around priority. I, I, I don't think um, uh, some of these should be the first choice. We should be prioritizing a little bit more thoroughly as I'd suggested uh, some of these. Um, I think some of them are unlikely to happen. I think uh, while uh, ensuring that central government agencies trap funding um, with the greatest respect, I don't think um, the pursuit of GST should be the highest priority uh, after that. I think um, it's probably at the lower end, given that you're going to have a lot of resistance anyway. Um, so you're better to pick the cherries, so to speak, that you will have more success with and to leave the tougher ones as a lower priority. So at least get the, the low-hanging cherry, uh, low-hanging fruit done first. Um, Again, uh, while I certainly support um, entrenchment, again, I think entrenchment is quite a high bar to achieve. And I would be surprised if central government, um, especially the current government, would support that. Uh, so again, um, I think you're better to invest your resources in lobbying uh, and energy in some of the other uh, areas. Um, I think, uh, uh, the uh, Murray Wards uh, certainly um, agree with where that's sitting. Um, the, the concern I have is the low ranking of the deterioration of occupied buildings, which I think is a real concern for the wider local government community and uh, will be for us going forward uh, longer term. And I think that issue really needs to be addressed. It's not properly addressed in legislation. And if there was one that government would be open to, I think it's uh, more likely to be this one. So it's unfortunate that the majority of councillors consider this to be a really low issue. I think it should be much higher. Um, and therefore, I, I, I don't necessarily support the rankings you've provided. So I'm not sure how we uh, how we go about this, but uh, uh, if it's defeated, do we re-rank them? Or uh, what's the process? Uh, I, guess, I guess if, it, if it's defeated, yes, we go for a, another conversation. I think the purpose of getting people's feedback outside the meeting was to avoid uh, several potential uh, hours of roundabouting about the relative priority. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with you. Some of these are potentially unlikely to happen. That doesn't necessarily mean uh, that we should make them a lower priority just because we don't think they are, they're going to happen. They may still be a high priority. I think the GST one's interesting because in actual fact, uh, I think it's X policy, and I think it is actually a coalition agreement uh, undertaking to return the GST on um, uh, property property sales or property development. So yeah, I think, I, I think I a number of X policies, though, I, I, uh, are not supported by the excuse, government. So excuse just, me, Mac. Uh, I didn't interrupt you when you were speaking. Um, I'm sorry, I thought it was a conversation. I, I'm just I'm just commenting. Um, so again, it, it may not be that wholesale return of GST is a realistic option, but consideration of GST, and I think it has been a priority for LGNZ previously in terms of the way that GST is treated. So um, I, I do accept that some of these will be 
potentially challenging to get across. And ultimately, we are one vote out of 60-something or other uh, in relation to these remits and the ranking in any event. So quite how much our influence is going to impact on the final ranking will be will be interesting. So, but if, yes, indeed, if this is lost, we will then come back to debate uh, where things sit. So can the so can the priorities of all the other councillors be circulated? To everyone? So yes, so I have asked them? Robin to circulate it. Hopefully, it is winging its way to you as we speak. Right. Cool. Thank you, uh, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much. I'm through you, Mr. Me. I'm not. Oh, was that moved or not? I'm happy to move it. Um, I guess the interesting thing for me when I thought about it, and I definitely take your point in terms of we're one of 67 councils and ability to influence whatever. Uh, but the bigger question for me was at some point, and I wonder whether we could think about this prior to the next process of um, LGFA FA draft remits for us around this council table to have a think about whether there are any remits that we might like to uh, put forward. Um, you know, some topics that come to my mind, um, you know, I I'm thinking about the whole insurance question, uh, which is quite perplexing, I think, for local government at the moment. Um, I'm thinking about audit. I'm thinking about forestry, um, that there may be some remits that collectively we could put our heads together around. So my request would be sometime next year, early on, could we make sure that we have a, have a discussion around remits? Yep, I'm happy. I think uh, that will be noted in the uh, minutes as uh, an action. Uh, is there a seconder for the resolution? Uh, Councillor Kinnamoth, yeah, I can see Councillor Greening's hand is back up. Uh, are there any further speakers? Uh, oh, Councillor Kinnamoth, do you wish to speak as well as second? Yep, I do. All good. Thank you, through the Mayor. Um, having not been to, oh, sorry, been to one LGNZ, is this sufficient information for our representatives to be able to present the case? And do they need an alternative? Do they need any more support or any other? No, in the actual AGM, it is pretty much the proponents may speak to it and provide uh, as is included in the remits themselves. But in terms of the wider conversation, it's generally just a um, a, a vote. That there is, again, bearing the 67 councils, there's how many remits. Um, yeah, that it's, I think the information is sufficient. It just gives them a got direction from the council to exercise that vote when they get the opportunity. Uh, Councillor Hill. Thank you, Chair. I'll be voting to support this. I think it was helpful to uh, um, be able to submit our rankings and um, someone's obviously uh, managed that process and produced this for us. Um, I don't have any problem with that. I think it's helpful. It's a helpful way to go about it. And of course, we can discuss that here and now if we wanted our things to be different. But um, we we would otherwise could be here for hours, I imagine. Um, and really, at it, it conference, it's a it's a vote. So Kit's going to do that. Or Councillor Manning will do that. Uh, should he be there? And um, <clears throat> it's simply a yes yes or no of support. So yeah, and and that's something might not happen. Well. There's a whole lot of things I've voted for in my life that never happened, and it's how it goes, isn't it? It is. Uh, are there any further comments, uh, Councillor Greening? Yeah, just on relation to uh, future remits, it would be uh, useful to know uh, a timeline for us in submitting remits. Um, uh, in many debates that were had, uh, one nearly last week, uh, it was lamented the fact that there wasn't a national regulation on alcohol promotion at sporting events, and it seems like the most obvious uh, remit to put to LGNZ for wider support nationally. And also, I think the comment was made about feral cat national uh, regulation of feral cats. Again, that would be, uh, again, something that we might want to remit as well. So uh, 
when will we be putting forward remits and will that include the alcohol promotion at sporting events that everyone has lamented? Well, I, I don't think we can predetermine what the remits will be because ultimately that will have to be a conversation with council over what remits we wish to uh, put up or individual councillors may have ideas, but ultimately it will need to be agreed by the whole of council. So post this meeting, uh, we will circulate the time frame by which we need to uh, have remits for next year uh, into LG and Z, and then we will obviously work back from that date to provide the opportunity for people to uh, both propose what they believe we should do, and then a time for the council to consider um, either supporting or not those particular arrangements. So that will be done post this meeting. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, oh, I think it is, it is an interesting conversation about. Um, and noting some of the comments that Councillor Greeny just made in terms of national direction and or decision making uh, versus local decision making. And actually, it's interesting that local government often tries to have a bit of both, which is, yeah, I guess fair enough. Um, but I actually didn't support the entrenchment idea on the basis that we have strongly argued that it should be councils who decide for their communities whether or not to have uh, Māori boards. And it shouldn't be subject to a referendum, but it should be a decision that is token, taken locally. The flip side of that is should council decide to not have one, that also should be, if you follow the logic and the rationale, a decision that is made locally. So sometimes it is, you know, you the localism debate and the question about whether or not you should have the autonomy to make decisions on behalf of your community, sometimes you have to take like both sides of that conversation and go, actually, you will have to accept that sometimes if you go for a much more locally decided and whether it's uh, alcohol advertising um, restrictions or not, or whether it's the representation model that you choose to have in your region or your location, uh, or whether it's any of the other things that we put up for remits. Uh, it's quite often interesting to see where we're asking for more local determination and where we're asking for more national direction. And sometimes there is yeah. potentially a bit of conflict in there. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what the ultimate outcome of these is. And it might be interesting to circulate previous remits just because there are often many. I think they have tried to reduce the number of remits at LG and Z meetings because it got to a point where there were a lot. Uh, and again, I think the point Councillor Greeny made earlier that local government New Zealand has limited resources to promote, propose, suggest and uh, lobby for outcomes. And if it ends up with 97 remits to try and propose, promote and work through, uh, that's probably going to be challenging. So I guess being pretty selective over if we are going to put remits in, just acknowledging that if we put in three, four, five or six, and that was replicated all around the country, it was suddenly become a bit unwieldy. Uh, with that, I shall put the resolution unless the mover wishes to have a right of reply. If not, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against. Against. The resolution. Would you like your vote recorded, Councillor Greening? Uh, no point. It's never recorded in the minutes. Thank you. I will... I will not record, have your vote recorded in the minutes then. Uh, next up, we will move back to is, uh, machinery resolutions. Is Doug, oh, no, Doug is here. I will do the machinery resolutions first in any event. So can I have a mover and or uh, move Councillor Mailing? Is there a second for the machinery resolutions? Councillor Maru? All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against carried. We'll now come back to the first item on the agenda. Um, so, Doug, welcome. And uh, if you'd like to come up. And Dave Ashcroft as well. Thanks. Welcome, Dave. Uh, so back to item 7.1 in terms of the presentation of Wymere Water Limited in relation to their statement of intent. And I'll hand over to you, Doug, when you're when you're ready. Thank you, um, Tim. Um, we um, we're here today to present the updated statement of intent, intent as of the 30, 30th of June. Um, yeah, I think you all received the 
copy of it, paper copy, yeah. So uh, we'll just briefly say, you know, highlight just a few things and then uh, take any questions. Thank you. So Dave will present. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, apologies for Mike Scott, who uh, is uh, nice. not make it today. Um, so yeah, the two pieces, there's the SOI, which is in the papers, and uh, there's a, pre a brief update, which we'll do the slides. Um, I'm not sure who's got the control of that. We can go to the... Oh, thank you. Um, so for this slide, for those of us on the team, this was a pretty big day for us to celebrate. Um, it was the day that the reservoir filled and the spillway started to flow. Um, for the first time, and so you know we're pretty uh, pretty pleased on this one, um, and, a, and a photo that we really that we really really like. Um, I'm going to not uh, read the content of the slides, talk to them a little bit, and go as quickly as I can. So next slide, please. Um, um, so since then, since that reservoir was first filled, and these are the two fundamental themes in the SOI, uh, we're working on both post construction activities and the, and the first year of operations. So that's essentially our strategic context captured in the in the statement of intent, construction is complete, um, and, we're, and we're working on, you know, so to say, the, the post-construction activities, which is uh, lots of commissioning, documentation, uh, setting things up for operations, uh, and making sure that the operations team is all ready to go with its own set of policies and processes. Um, and part of that um, key transition will be to the with dam um, provisions in the TRMP. Um, so we can go back a couple more slides, I think, if we can. Yeah, so this is another um, one where the team is pretty, pretty especially proud of themselves for having finished the dam and getting to this point where um, we actually prove what it said on the tin. Uh, the theory is to you know capture water when it's wet and release it when it's dry. Um, and for a period of four to six weeks, you can see on that little chart there um, on the left where we released about twenty percent of the reservoir to keep the reservoir, keep the river flowing, um, and to you know ensure that water restrictions. Um, didn't get any harder than they were at the time. So again, that's just something that, um, you know, that active release of water to recharge the aquifers and keep the river flowing. Dam's doing exactly what it's meant to do. Yeah, these are the numbers. Um, you can read it where it is. We're, yeah, as of today, we're about 202. Um, forecast is up to 206. Uh, and uh, contract disputes uh, re remains a risk for us. Um, Well, there's just a couple of images there that, uh, you know, way back when, or anything was built there, and uh, that yellow line is the hypothetical line of the dam crest. And on the right-hand side, um, the reservoir full, and it's the way all set up to go. Sorry, I can't hear. I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Greening, uh, open for questions, comments uh, of Wyomere Water. Uh, Councillor Mayling. Oh, well, thank you for your presentation. Um, do we have a date from the commissioning when um, the, all the documentation is finished and it will be signed off and issued to Council so that our RMA plan for fresh water can be applied on the Wyomere plains? Because at the moment we've been using um, interim provisions, and I see Kim at the back. I think this last season we used interim provisions. So we're waiting on the final sign-off so that the um, the water plan for the Wymere Plains can be fully used. And I'll attempt to talk to that one. Um, so it's essentially in council's hands. Um, we've got some uh, processes to go through, hydrology reports to provide. Uh, and we're in the process, so um, I don't know exactly when the uh, transition or the completion will go to the with dam provisions. I suspect it'll be um, weeks rather than months, um, but we're uh, we're in the process with council. That could be provided to us when, by, by Mike Scott at some stage that will be very useful because it, it does affect how we deal with um, droughts going forward. Yeah, we will. Thank you very much. Uh, further questions, I can't agree. Yeah, um, a couple of questions. Um, just broadly to give you a heads up. Um, interested in 
costs, which you've just indicated. Uh, interested in your position on insurance. Uh, wouldn't like an update on uh, the contractor dispute. And uh, I have a question about directors. So first of all, uh, cutting straight to the big question, which I'm no doubt all the residents and uh, would be most interested in is, it was 198, it's now 202. Can you explain what's driven that? And you're forecasting 206. Uh, they'll probably want to know, can you explain that as well? Yeah, thanks, Councillor. Yeah, um, yeah, 198 is our um, was the estimate to finish. We haven't spent all of that yet, um, but we um, there's one of the disputes was 8.3 million. It was a determination from an adjudication, and that um, provides the um, 206, but we've only spent 202 to date. And the reason for the 202, how did we get from 198 to 202? What was the driver there? It was a determination from the dispute. And the 206 forecast, uh, what's your driver for getting to that forecast? It's the same, it's the same thing, it's but including the, the extra few million to, you know, to go through and finish through the sign off. So I suppose following on from that, um, most people will be interested to know uh, when this contractor dispute um, will likely end and we'll know exactly uh, where we stand. So um, are you able to uh, indicate exactly uh, when the contractor dispute uh, will likely be finished and to do we yet know the extent of the total quantum that is being disputed? Uh, no, no, I don't. I can't say you know, it's on. Uh, it's ongoing. Um, that's just one of them. Yeah, we don't know what we don't know else. I can't. I can't tell you. Sorry, councillor. Any more detail than that? That's right. Um, I mean, we had a confidential briefing yesterday, and I'm not hearing much more than what you just said today. Uh, my impression is no one knows what the quantum is going to be. That's that's correct. Mm. Um, so my other question just relates to insurance. Uh, so uh, there's an indication that you're proposing to reduce this by 185K. Can you explain how you are proposing to reduce this amount? Uh, that's one for me. So in the uh, original estimation, um, we, were, we, we had literally estimated what we thought the insurance cover would be. We went through a pretty robust uh, process with insurers. We've got a new broker. Uh, and uh, the, the result of the negotiations was a savings. So has is, is that in any way uh, been driven by a reduction in coverage, or is that just a great price? Uh, that's just a great price. Fantastic. Um, and finally, uh, just on the going forward, because we've gone now through construction, you've completed it, um, what's, the, what's the plan in terms of uh, the skill mix around the table and... Uh, What's the program there? Do we have the right skills? Uh, do we need a change of skills? Uh, what's your program there? Um, you mean the board or the, the, um, board, yes. or the executive? Uh, the board. The board. Um, the, we have to, have to still have discussions with um, the shareholders or T, there's T, some of the um, directors are TDC appointees um, and some of them are from uh, Will. And um, some and one is from the iwi, and um, so therefore we've got to still have a discussion amongst the shareholders about that. So when is that likely to happen, and when will we have a bit more direction? It'll be soon. Um, it'll be um, we. Uh, I think the CEO's already had a discussion with um, Mr Drummond about the num the numbers and the school level. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Green and Councillor McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much through you, Mr Mayor. Um, thanks, Doug and Dave. Um, ju I'm just thinking about Waimea Water Limited and, you know, your future operating model, I guess, when you're all uh, condensed down, you're not constructing, you're actually running. Um, how far through that are you and and when do you think you will have landed on what Waimea Water Limited definitely needs to look like going forward? Then yeah, I'll, I'll make an attempt at that. Um, so the, the, you know, the original team was essentially um, a generalist environmental person, myself and a finance person, 
and a team and a group of engineers. Um, all the engineers currently are in the process of being demobilised. Um, I suspect that, uh, this again, this is months to get um, some of them to finish off the post-construction activities. And at that point, um, it will be left with the generalist and myself uh, and maybe a, um, you know, some kind of operations supervisor or something to that effect. So I think it'll be a very light team in two years from now. Um, and uh, and with engineering expertise, you know, brought in commission that's required for specialist activities. Uh, I hope that answered the question. I'll just fill in, sorry, uh, Councillor, there's the... Um... Uh, the first two years is the defect liability period, which so that will be going on at the same time as the operation. So as um, Dave said, the skill mix will change after the two years, but there's a bit of a mix in the first time. Okay, no, I understand that. Thank you very much. Councillor Hill. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Thank you. In terms of the process so far, so there's been an adjudication process, and is it correct that that's um, an interim and non-final matter and that the uh, next step, which is arbitration, things start fresh again? Could you just explain a little bit about the process around that? I'm sorry, I can't comment on it. It's um, I'm bound by law not to talk about the, both the arbitrate, um, any adjudication or arbitration. I, I apologise. Yes, I, I suppose I'm more asking around the process of it, just how these processes work generally. In general terms, um, one party puts a claim in um, and, and puts a notice and then there's an appointment of and either an adjudicator or an arbitrator, depending on what they ask for. But we, as why why me water, um, probably in a position of defending um, the claims that come come with the contract. I'm speaking in general terms. Here. Yes. And then it progresses from there um, to um, uh, being taken by an arbitrator or an adjudicator, and then there's a, a reply. Usually, then they ask for a reply, and then there's another reply. From the um, other from the other party, and then there's a thing called a rejoinder. So um, there's a process that happens, and adjudication is a lot quicker than an arbitration. I'm trying to have made clear here something that's um, difficult to make clear, but it's, I am asking in terms of process. So uh, can adjudications be an, uh, interim and non-final? And then matters be further explored in a um, um, arbitration. Yeah, that that that's the process. Yeah. 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 Which may relate to that. Some have some bearing on the numbers, so we'll have to wait and see. I think the key point is there is a significant amount of process yet to play out in regards to. Um, this particular issue. Yeah. Uh, anything further in relation to the SOI? Uh, yeah, <laughs> Councillor Dahi. Yeah, thank you. It's sort of related and sort of not. Uh, exciting time getting the dam at this stage and fantastic health and safety record throughout the um, build. Uh, the, uh, I don't know where we go with this, but there's been talk of generation in the past, electricity generation. Have Will expressed any interest in possibly exploring that long? Because it seems like with change in central government, there might be opportunities uh, from certain ministers to latch on if there was a proposal going forward. So has any thought been given to generation lately? Um, I think the irrigators have always been keen to have a look at a serious look at um, generation, electricity generation. Um, no decision as yet, um, and the, you know there could be. It's possible, right? It's possible to have generation in the future. Supplementary. So, I guess what I'm saying is there might be an opportunity out there in the air somewhere, maybe or maybe not. And just having an ear out and having a bit of a think about what might be possible now might be worth considering. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dakey. Anything further uh, for either Doug or Dave? If not, thank you, gentlemen, for coming in and presenting. And 
we will now move on to the second part. Uh, no, just the presentation. The motion relates to the next item, which uh, is the statement of intent. And Mike is now at the table. Mike, I'll hand over to you. Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Um, there are no particular matters I need to bring to Council's attention in regards to the final statement of intent. It's consistent with the draft statement of intent uh, you reviewed and were comfortable with earlier this year. I'll note that the financials have been updated for the latest estimates. Um, that will give a challenge for Council in that the water charges are approximately $216,000 higher than what we provided for in our long-term plan. Uh, that's simply because the estimates arrived um, to us in the statutory time frame, but later uh, than the close off of the financials for the LTP. The finance team will work these through uh, and see what the implications are. On the all other things being equal, that will cause a funding shortfall this year. Um, that's the area that is um, driving most of that change. Most of that additional cost is financing costs in relation to an irrigated capacity loan, um, and that council is responsible for until the 30th of June, uh, 2026. Um, and the interest costs on that portion uh, of the irrigated loan are actually met from general rates. So the impact is on general rates rather than the other rates in relation to the dam. Quite happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, Councillor Greening. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I hate to labour the issue, but so um, so five point two states that the overall impact for twenty twenty four water charges to council is an increase of two hundred sixteen thousand. So um, can can you just explain how much more the Waimea Dam Zone of Benefit or general district rates are to increase? Uh, to pay for the additional 216,000. 216, um, how is council intending to fund this increase? And will this 216 increase, or shortfall as you call it, uh, need to be recovered from a general rates increase in 2025, 26 and beyond? Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor. We're currently reworking the numbers in terms of the rate strike. The, my team is busy um, doing the rate strike today, so there's some uncertainty about the level of the general rate. Uh, that's partly because um, there is a timing delay between setting the rates and striking the rates, uh, but also because we're in the middle of a district-wide revaluation re objection period. So it's a little bit early to determine what we will collect in general rates. But all other things being equal, it would mean we would need to collect an additional 216,000 uh, in general rates in uh, 2020, uh, in the next financial year. Um, and that um, will have an impact on rates. I can't at this stage estimate what that impact will be. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Greening. Is there any other questions of Mike or someone willing to move the resolution? I'm happy to move, Mr. Mayor. Uh, move Councillor Manning, seconded Councillor Dowler. Councillor Green, is your hand back up or is it just still up? Apologies, it's live now. Yeah. No, sorry. Uh, yep, uh, Councillor Murray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just on the same along the lines of um, Councillor Green, Mike. So 216, didn't I hear general rate is probably where that's going to come from? So isn't that 0.2% in our an, an estimate in terms of next year's rating to recover that? And that would uh, probably be correct, but I'm looking at what the impact is from the rate strike this year. If we collect more general rates than what we had anticipated in the LTP budget, then the deficit to collect next year, assuming council uses the rates for this extra rates for this purpose, would be less. Yes, and point two. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, all those in favour, please say hi. Aye. Against. Carried. Uh, right, at this point, I think we will break uh, briefly for 10 minutes, come back at half past 10, and the last item on the agenda, which is also probably the main item on the agenda, uh, is the representation review. And so uh, the, next, the next item is the initial proposal for the representation review. 
uh, and I will hand over to Leith, lucky you, um, to introduce the item. And so note there are some changes in the resolution. They're highlighted in red. Uh, I'm not sure if those on Zoom can see the screen share. So I'll uh, just account. make sure that's being shared. And these are as a result of the resolution being um, passed through, uh, shown to uh, the local government um, local government commission, and this is their feedback just in terms of ensuring clarity in the resolution. So those changes are highlighted in red, and you'll be able to see them. So. Oh, okay. I'll also note that Stephen Hill from Elections NZ uh, is on Zoom should there be any questions of him in relation to any of the conversation uh, that we are about to have. There is also red on the bottom. So uh, Lisa's probably going to explain this, but basically what that wording there means, is because I went oh too when I saw it, uh, is that not to discount the possibility that should there be a Māori ward councillor, that they too could be appointed to the community board alongside other elected representatives. So it's not to say that they would or should, but just to leave open the option that they could. Uh, for the Chair, that's correct, uh, although I do note that for the Motueka community board, uh, that would mean a ward councillor dropping off. Because they can't be because more than 50%. More. Correct. So it isn't to, yeah, so, and so again, this is a suggestion of or requirement of, I don't know whether it's a suggestion or a requirement. Uh, through the chair, it was a suggestion from the Local Government Commission uh, based on feedback they've given to other councils that uh, they had inadvertently precluded the Māori ward Councillor from being appointed to the community boards. Okay, so that's that particular red item. Okay, please, sorry to uh, jump in before you had the chance to summarise your report, but I will hand back to you now. Yes, I note, uh, Councillor Greening, your, or do you have a question in relation to the red? Yes, yes. So I just wonder whether the Mochoeka one, given there's a restriction on the number of councillors, the or should be or two ward councillors and the Māori ward rather than and. Yes, that actually does make it clearer still. So when we come to uh, the formulation of the resolution, um, we'll take note of that potential change and come back to it. Okay, Leith, over to you. Well, through the chair, I mean, the purpose of this report is to bring before you uh, options for the initial proposal for the council's representation review. Um, the proposed initial proposal is uh, similar to the current representation arrangements, with the notable exception being an inclusion of a Māori ward. Um, as you're all aware, uh, Council made the decision in September last year to include a Māori ward uh, as part of its representation arrangements. The uh, new government has signalled a change to the law and that has gone to select committee but has not yet been in force. Once the law is passed, we will be bringing you another report uh, on the Muddy Ward which uh, outlines what the legislation says when it's finally passed and the decision that uh, you'll have to make, which as it currently stands, is rescind or continue towards a poll. And we'll be providing all of that context in the subsequent report. Um, otherwise, I will take the report as read and I'm available to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Murray and Councillor Kinnamont. Thank you through the Mayor. Um, so, Leith, uh, what do we community board sense? I guess there's a couple of options, isn't there? Because if there was five elected members, the balance would be rectified by four members, or it could be that um, the Māori ward and one ward councillor from each in rotation of the Golden Bay and Motueka wards as part of that community board. So I don't know if it's just an either or, I think. But where we, we pick those options up in the submissions and the reconsideration once it's been at the consultation, where will we pick the final 
And what are we going to put out to start with? Well, I mean, at the moment, this is what we're putting out, which is an and or, um, and I note Councillor Greening's uh, proposed amendment to that. Um, yeah, that's... Okay. And then just the other question. So there was um, submissions in the pre-engagement to the um, to the representation review. Will they be considered again in the and the um, the hearings for the final review, or do those parties need to resubmit? Through the chair, uh, if parties have made a submission for the pre-engagement, it'll absolutely be reconsidered as part of the initial proposal. Uh, Councillor Kinnamont. Thank you, through the mayor. Um, your best intent or best idea as you just said then that um, legislation is going through the government at the moment, how long do you think that would take to get through to signing off? Is this years away or is this months away, weeks away? I, I mean, through the chair, we're looking at, at potentially weeks away. The difficult thing from our perspective is that the current legislation says that we need to go live with this initial proposal before the end of July. Um, so we are in a, a slightly difficult position with the potential new legislation. But... Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Manning and Councillor McKenzie, and then Councillor Ellis. Oh, well, I can't support this proposal, uh, and it's based on population, because um, as we heard in the public forum, 71% of our population that doesn't comply. Um, the last time we actually looked at wards was well before I was on council. As I understand it, it was about 2006, 18 years ago. And that's when the Murchison Lakes ward lost one councillor because of population and Richmond gained one because of population. And if you look at the Local Government Act, our representation should be on population and communities. So Golden Bay get, got an extra councillor because of isolation. I don't think you can argue that isolation now. In my time on council, that road was been significantly closed once. And it was for a relatively long period. But if you look at the technology changes that have happened over those 18 years, people now can attend on Zoom. And it counts. Councillor Greening attends on Zoom 99% of the time. And the ward councillors do. And I've attended on Zoom um, from somewhere in Alaska, from Vancouver, and from Auckland recently. So, you know, your presence can be here, but not actually be in the room. So I don't think the isolation now takes place. And you compare it with the Murchison Ward, which has one councillor and 4,000 people, the Murchison Lakes Ward is actually a bigger land area than Golden Bay and also has four community associations for the councillor to attend. So the deputy mayor is really busy because South Wakefield is part of his area. So he attends the Wakefield Association Community Association meeting as well as Tapawera, Lakes and Murchison. So he's got a big workload. Um, there has been a significant change in our populations in the last... 18 years, particularly in the Mutri Waimi Award and in the Richmond Award. And in the last three years, it's been significant in Richmond. And, and you, you just look at the figures. It's very difficult to justify what we're doing now because we're taking an easy option with what's proposed. We haven't gone out and asked those hard questions um, because I, I believe you, at minimum, you need to change the boundaries in Waimi and Mutri because it's under representation. And in fact, um, Mochawaka's represent population hasn't increased because we haven't had the land um, because the development hasn't taken place that we thought would. Um, I've made lots of notes. So to me, to, um, to get fair representation, Golden Bay needs to lose a councillor. And that's not a personal attack on the two councillors because I really value their input, but I just think they're overrepresented when you base it on population, and they have a community board as well. Um, 
we haven't addressed these boundaries, and I think we we should. And if you actually look at the options that were presented, the two that I think are best is either option 1A, which is one less moderate uh, Golden Bay councillor, or option 3A, which is actually three wards of four. But then um, you have some problems with communities of interest because you'd be absorbing, and I think Councillor Greening raised this in, in the workshops, you'd be absorbing Lakes Murchison into Mootry and you'd be absorbing Golden Bay into Machuaika. I think that would probably cause more upset. But whenever you do a representation review, it causes angst because people get used to what they've had. But if you think about um, what happens in uh, our general elections, boundaries change pretty much for every election because of population, or at least every second election. Um, so we should be reflecting those changes going forward. And I, I, I've signalled an amendment to uh, option 1A, which reduces those, that um, representation in Golden Bay, and I've signalled it to um, Leith, and, and the reasons are in there. Uh, I'm not going to move that yet because I want to hear the discussion, but I'm signalling that I don't believe that we can justify two councillors in Golden Bay anymore because the remoteness I don't believe is there. And um, I believe the boundaries in the Mutri Waimea ward need to be adjusted because of the growth that we've seen in Wakefield, Brightwater, and Mapua in particular, and in Tasman with the um, increase in subdivisions in the uh, Rural 3 area. And I'm currently chairing a plan change for Wakefield that adds another 300 potential sections out there. And just over a year ago, we did a plan change for Brightwater that added about another 200 sections. So, so there is growth coming, and we've got a structure plan coming ahead in Mapua, which will possibly add more sections there in the time. So there's going to be more growth in that particular ward going forward. So that's why I don't think, one, we don't meet the rules now, and it's only going to get worse. So at some stage, we have to bite the bullet and make these tough decisions and go out. And I don't think this one does. So that's my view, and I'm signalling that I may be moving an amendment uh, near the so end. I would note the fact there's nothing moved now, so you can move whatever you like at the moment. Um, but that's over to you. Um, I'll, I'll listen, to, listen to the discussion through. Okay. Well, uh, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr Mayor. Um, I, I've got a couple of points I want to make, but firstly, just a question of clarification, if I can. So, Lise, you mentioned that we need to notify this by the end of July um, or whatever, put it out there. Um, what happens if we don't meet that time frame? Uh, for the chair, I mean, that would mean the council is uh, not meeting its statutory obligations. In terms of what the effect of that might be, that might be a question for Stephen. Stephen, would you like to attempt to answer that question. I, I wish I had an answer for you, but no, it, I, I'm not clear on what specific sanctions might apply, but um, certainly it would um, would attract the attention of the Local Government Commission and, uh, and, and be noted as being outside the statutory requirements. I guess, yes, thank you. Thank you. I guess I'm not particularly phased by that. To be honest, it sounds slightly like a wet bus ticket, but um, anyway, oh no, we don't have bus tickets now, do we? We have big cards. Um, okay, so I've got two points that I want to make. Um, one of them is actually, I think during the workshops we had, and it was on one of the options, I spoke about um, church review in Wakefield. Um, and so I've during the week, I've actually sought the map to actually show the boundary between Mertry Waimea and Lakes Murchison with respect to that area. Um, because I had always been told that, you know, one side of Tote Review was in one ward and the other side was in the other ward. Um, according to the map that I've been supplied with, actually that whole 
subdivision all the way up there um, is all in the Lakes Murchison ward. Now, t it's crazy to me. I mean, this is like a suburb of Wakefield. So this is like putting a line actually through suburban Richmond, almost. Um, and in the report, um, we actually talk about uh, on page 117, and I'll just read it out here. Um, we, we say that actually, uh, if we did anything different, it would limit effective representation by dividing communities of interest between wards. I mean, we are majorly dividing a community of interest, actually, already within the ward. I mean, people that live here, honestly, if, if you get in your car and you drive around, it's like you're a stone throw from Wakefield. The, the children go to the Wakefield school. The, the, the participants there drive initiatives within the Wakefield community. But we think that it's a community of interest to actually link them to their next nearest biggest settlement, which is Sananit or Murchison. It honestly makes no sense. I mean, I know historically we did it because it does come down to a numbers game. But I, I just think that if we're going to put this proposal out, let's not pretend we're not dividing a community of interest because actually it does divide a community of interest. Um, and then my next point actually is um, in the report on page 124, um, we actually talk about, I guess it's about community boards, and we make this comment that um, many community associations have been opposed in the past to the establishment of community boards advocating for the retention of their community associations. Now, community associations are really, really important and they fulfil a great um, role in these communities, but I've been involved in these community associations now for coming up almost five years, and in those five years, to the best of my knowledge, the council has never gone to those community organisations and asked them whether you know, where they're at in terms of community organisations or community boards. I mean, this might be a true statement, but when we say um, in the past, we've got to realise that that's at least five years, might, might be more, could be 10 years, I don't know. But how are we actually, I mean, when I go to these community association meetings, um, you know, we get given a list of things that are important on a monthly basis to communicate to community organisations and then the ward councillors, we always add our own things into it because we think there are important things that they need to know and I've always been up front and said we're doing a representation review and all the rest of it. That's, that's what I'm doing. But, but what is actually the council doing to understand where they're at and their thinking? So, you know, I think that's quite a big statement to put in the report. So are you willing to move anything? I'm just asking. Because so far we've had two very quite long and eloquent speeches, but no one's moved anything yet. So I'm just, I'm just, you don't have to. It's not a compulsion. I'm just asking. It's, all, it's, it's well to point out the issues and challenges, but yeah, yeah, yeah. we do need... So we have a proposed resolution and a suggested one. Uh, Councillor Mayling suggested some amendments slash alterations. You've indicated that you believe there should be some amendments slash alterations. So at some point we will need to get yeah. to the point of debating what amendments or alterations people wish to make or, or not, as the case may be, yeah, if someone yeah. moves the resolution as it yeah. is um, currently contained. So I, I will move on to the next speaker yeah. and then uh, come back to you, Councillor Ellis. Uh, thank you. Um... Um, thank you for so much for your report. Yeah, she's a tricky base, doesn't she? Um, thank you, uh, Councillor um, McKenzie has asked one of my questions, um, although I'm no clearer than other than a, a wet bus ticket. Um, and I perhaps too 
may be happy to run that risk of, of taking a bit more time on this process. Um, can I just have another question though? With in the advent of the law change and the potential risk of having a um, referendum on the Māori wards, do we, my understanding is that we don't, but do we have any budget in the long-term plan for that particular process? No, not specific. And I'd just like to make the observation that while we have discussed about the amount of representation uh, within each area, um, we haven't included that uh, community boards actually increase the amount of participation and representation. So that actually has an effect, in my view, um, on the population per, not councillor, but representation, and that actually makes that option worse for uh, Richmond, as discussed by uh, councillor Mayling. Okay, thank you, Councillor Ellis. I've got Councillor Kenamont, then Councillor Greening. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, sorry. Thank you, through the Chair. Um, listening to Councillor McKenzie talk about community associations, I totally agree. And I've, I also, not as many years, been doing this with Councillor McKenzie, see the council, the community associations, from being very proactive and looking after the community to other ones who are on the other side who are just reliant on council input and is very, very focused on the council more than the community. So I ask, maybe you're having a, a chairs meeting, Mr. Mayor, with the uh, community board chairs in August? Maybe that'd be a one, one um, forum to bring up how we can be more inclusive and in working with one another. I'll just put that out there as a thought. Um, please, page 116, clause 3, bullet point 4. So this is to do with Golden Bay Ward. This is to travel time to council officers, affecting the council's capacity to provide services to the community. Um, I asked Councillor Buck Butler the other day, and she told me there's a service centre there, there's a library. But the other communities don't have libraries and service centres. I think the Golden Bay is well uh, supported by the council there. And the other bullet point above it is um, the, the use of the word frequently, one suggest after... Transit New Zealand spent thirty million dollars doing the road up. I think it's less frequent than what it used to be, and some of those arguments of uh, retaining the Golden Bay as a um, because of um, these arguments here is very thin. And I'd probably suggest that, um, and nothing against the people that are representing Golden Bay, that I would suggest that maybe one councillor is sufficient. That, and that would also meet the 10% deviation. So do I just ask you to comment on the last two bullet points that I've talked about? Uh, through the chair, I mean, those bullet points uh, are and essentially mm -hmm. Uh, arguments as to why the uh, Golden Bay community doesn't meet that fair or shouldn't meet that fair and representative arrangements. Um, I, I mean, fingers crossed that State Highway 60 remains open due to weather, um, uh, through all weather events. And I believe the bullet point four was probably referring to uh, council officers as in. Uh, these offices rather than access to service centres and other sort of things. But I, I accept that it's not as clear as it could be. Thank you, Councillor Kenamont, Councillor Greening, and then Councillor Dakey and then Councillor Hill. Yeah, so um, I've been listening to the discussion so far. So um, I think. Uh, my preference, as I said pretty much earlier on in the workshops, is 
take a bit more of a mature approach to the, uh, the debate, recognise that community boards are present uh, in two of these communities and that we're delegating more power to these communities. And I think that should follow, should um, uh, Councillor Mayling's uh, option 3A or 2A persist. Um, I think the, the concern probably, and um, maybe Golden Bay uh, representatives can maybe articulate it more, but I think the concern in Golden Bay will be um, with the 3A option, um, that they're going to be outvoted by Mochawaka and it will be three uh, Mochawaka reps rather than two Mots and one Golden Bay. Um, but I, I just want to caveat that with um, every councillor around this table takes an oath to the district, uh, regardless of where they're elected from. And uh, this council has operated on the basis of looking at the district, district holistically. Um, uh, we've had some interesting debates around the table, but um, it's been interesting to note that on several occasions where uh, Golden Bay has been, um, shall we say, felt that it hasn't been properly representative, there have been councillors around the table who do not live in that district who have advocated for the interests of that district as well, recognising um, its special nature as well. So I don't think um, you necessarily have to come from Golden Bay to resent represent Golden Bay. Um, uh, for me, uh, um, and um, I'm going back now to the debate uh, around the community facility in Golden Bay and the grandstand, uh, we had many people outside of Golden Bay who were advocating for those facilities. Um, so um, I'm not always buying into the fact that um, if we go down a 3A option, uh, that Golden Bay won't be representative. Um, but I also think it needs to be tied with some maturity around the table and also delegating a bit more responsibility to the community boards should we go down a three-hour option. So, um, and just uh, responding to uh, Councillor McKenzie's uh, observation about um, arbitrary lines in the uh, in the community, I think Richmond has, has a really strong one down Champion Road, <laughs> uh, which is uh, half our community supposedly in Nelson which is even more confusing when you get to central government um, elections when suddenly Richmond is part of Nelson. Uh, so, um, so these lines are unfortunately rather arbitrary and are based on population. So I think um, uh, I would certainly support um, a 3A option. Um, uh, I think uh, 13 councillors is sufficient. I don't think we need to go to 14. Uh, that does mean that um, there is a loss, but we recognise that the data quite clearly shows it. Uh, there is over-representation for a very small community. Uh, the argument of isolation uh, has diminished, uh, and I think it's now fair to acknowledge that, um, and that these more isolated communities have uh, very strong um, and good uh, community um, representation in the community boards. Uh, which, which Richmond doesn't have, uh, it's only Mochawaka and Golden Bay, and that's a reflection of the historical mergers that have occurred to ensure that they are uh, properly represented. So um, uh, conscious of the fact that the mayor is waiting for someone to move, so I'm happy uh, to move on the basis that uh, option 3A is adopted uh, by this council. Uh, and um, and I'll close, uh, close my comments there and uh, see if there's any second. Thank you, Councillor Greening, uh, for moving something. Uh, is there a second for Council Green, Councillor Greening's suggestion? Uh, it would appear that, uh, despite your helpful suggestion, it has not been uh, taken up. So I'll move on to the next speaker, uh, Councillor Dakey. Thank you, through the Mayor. Um, I'll just start by saying some people in Richmond might feel they're overrepresented by councillors, so we'll just put that out there as a bit of a joke. Um, <laughs> Golden Bay is an interesting one. It is geographically isolated. They have 5,590 people. If you drop one councillor, then they're underrepresented. So, so it, it, I would be more concerned about underrepresentation than overrepresentation myself. So that's my thoughts on that. I would say, if anything, we can't do it because numbers are numbers and you can't bend them. But uh, I would say Deputy Mayor Bryant does an outstanding job with a very large area as one person. And if anything, it's probably Lakes Murchison that would benefit from another councillor as well, but that's not the system we work within. So 
I'm supportive of the status quo as it stays. I think we've tried to look at this, and when you try and move one bit, it makes it worse somewhere else. So I think what we've arrived on is functioning well at the moment. There's some real benefits, and especially in Golden Bay, should there be a change of councils over there and you have two people in, you may well end up with a scenario where one person is not up to speed. You could, if you had an individual councillor, you could have very poor representation in a very large area. So I think having two gives the community over there a real benefit. And a, and a real chance of having someone fair, decent represent them. So I'm supportive of the status quo as presented. Uh, are you going to move it? Yes, I'm happy to move that. Right. Ah, finally, is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Hill. Right. I have uh, Councillor Hill to speak next, and then I will. There will be a motion to debate, and then I will come back around for another game. Yeah. Thank so you. Panic. Thank you, Chair. It's easy to sort of be, you know, get to a, some simplistic thing here. Local government commission, who's it's their job, have made the determination in the past a couple of times, I think, around uh, our representation. Um, and I'm going to be indulgent here. So between Celia and I, we currently sit on joint shareholders, Port Karakohi, Takaki Aerodrome, Regional Pest, Commercial Committee, Audit and Risk, Regional Transport, Community Grants, Awards, Community Board, Joint Committee, Rec Park, Creative Communities, all four of these council meetings, many, many, many local groups. Uh, we come to all of the workshops mostly, and uh, we go to a lot of community events. If you ask one person to do all of that, they'd be way over full time in the role. And to say that, you know, councillors get elected, but we actually don't have to do anything. I don't know if people know that. Some people I let that know. I'm pretty shocked to think we just get the money. We can actually attend no meetings, no workshops, full term, and we will still receive the same pay. So the business about how we, yes, you have to base it on something. So we base it on how many people we are representing. And, of course, our ability to do that and whether those people want to be represented by me, that's a whole other ballgame. Some people do, and some people probably think I'm rubbish, and don't you think you're representing me, Miss Hill? You know, so the idea also that councillors can come on here and actually not attend to uh, an equitable amount of work in terms of the work of the committees. So I've just named some of the committees. There's a whole lot of others that you're all on to that we don't because we're in Golden Bay and we've got our own sewerage system, thanks. Um, but if you think about that, you can come on here, and we're going to get a really flash new one before too long, but, you know, you can come on here as a councillor and not be a member of any of those committees uh, that are outside of full council and three standing committees. And that, has, that uh, has been the case. So the business about representation and workload, the workload part doesn't come into it. So that's something to, um, I, I think it just encourages us not to be simplistic about this. And I take um, Councillor Dakey's point around if we're really concerned about representation, if people are overrepresented, uh, you have to have the other side of it. You can't have them underrepresented either. And so if we go with one Golden Bay Ward councillor uh, representing 5,590 people, uh, it's way over the limp, way over the next, Richmond's next or Motiri Waimea's next at 5117. So can't have it both ways. And I think the business about Zoom, Zoom's been very good in a lot of ways, and it certainly enables um, me to have more of the life that I would have at home when you just go home in 10 minutes for some of you, uh, and I spend an extra hour and a half or two hours getting home. Uh, so it does have an impact on our lifestyle differently, I think. Um, and we're up for the job. We put our hands up and we're pleased to be elected. So, you know, you suck that up. But don't. I think, I think it's important to be really... Um, awake to the complexities and differences in each of the wards and the types of communities we we represent. And I certainly know that in a small community, a, a lot of people know me, um, and I, I get approached all the time wherever I go about a whole lot of things, and that's the nature of being a representative in a small community, and many of you will have that experience as well. Um, and the notion that... Um, <clears throat> You don't have to be an award to represent it. Yes, we all have to uh, attend to all of the wards. That's what we sign up for. But um, I, I, I think the people that live in the wards uh, wouldn't have a lot of truck with that necessarily in terms of they do want people 
who know them and who live in that area and who maybe are from that area to represent them, and it does make a difference. And I think we do very well here in a collegial way to support the other wards and the other things that we're all wanting to have happen. It's good that we're not so entrenched around that. And um, thank you. And finally, I'll just say that I'm very pleased that it's the local government commission that will decide. Right, so just before, so there is now a motion on the table which has been moved by uh, Councillor Dakey. It's been seconded by Councillor Hill just before I go um, to another round of uh, comments on the resolution. Um, Stephen, do you often, and I apologise for asking off the top of your head, but do you know how many councils in New Zealand fully comply with the plus or minus 10%? Um, I can't put a figure on it, but I do know that there are a number that do not comply with the plus or minus 10%. Um, for reasons similar to those that Tasman has been exempted in the past. And that's why the Act specifically does make provision for exemption from the plus or minus 10% on the grounds of isolation, um, as well as the dividing and um, combining communities that don't have commonalities of interest. So um, certainly um, a number. Uh, sorry, I don't have a, a figure I can put on it, but there, there are many. I mean, it would be interesting to understand. Um, and it would also be interesting to understand the difference between regional councils and TAs, because I'm just looking at the regional, so this is on the Mel GNZ website, 2023 boundaries, population estimates based on the 2018 census. I think there's only one regional council that actually complies. If you look at all the others, some of the um, the differences are quite significant, minus 37%, plus 23%, minus 46% for the Fiordland constituency in Southland, which you know, probably not entirely surprising. I think it is really important to remember we're a unitary authority and we, we the regional council function. And if I reflect on the conversation uh, the other day in the discussion around the future of TRMP relation to water issues and water quality, it is disproportionately impacts on rural communities. Very few of those very big decisions that are very, and uh, the discussion the other day was about how important that is. But that massively over impacts on rural communities compared to urban communities. They will have you know, limited impacts on someone who lives in Richmond, for example, in the middle of Motueka. So I think it is really worth reflecting on that. The other thing that you note when you look at regional councils is they all have most, most, have significantly more constituencies or wards than four. So some of them, you know, six, seven, eight. Uh, and... I know our focus has been on reducing the number to make it more even, but perhaps that isn't the right way to look at it. Um, I think what is clear uh, is whatever you do, <laughs> whatever you do, uh, even if you keep the status quo, there will be people that don't you know, believe that's the right decision. And whatever other option you choose, there will be people who don't believe that's the right decision. Uh, and it's almost inevitable that it will end up in front of the local government commission to make a final determination. I think the last thing before we go back around is just that this is our initial proposal. And just before we go, can someone just reiterate the steps from here, the role of the community, whether they're community groups, whether they're community, whether they're individuals, or whether they are people who chose and made the effort to put in uh, presentations or submissions to the pre-consultation process. So steps from here in terms of initial proposal, then coming back to final proposal, et cetera. So Lee, could you just run us through that before we go around and discuss the resolution? Uh, Stephen, do you want to speak to that? What do you want me to? Uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to, to um, just summarise, um, but jump in, uh, Lee. Uh, steps from here uh, is that the proposal, um, which is adopted today, will be uh, formally notified by public notice um, and various communication and um, other activity will be undertaken to make the community aware. So it'll be then open for submissions for one month. Anybody can make a submission on the, um, on the initial proposal. Uh, they can request to be heard. So um, the council will hold um, hearings uh, at, um, uh, I think the date is, is, in, the, is in the paper. Um, and following the hearing of those submissions, the council will deliberate on its uh, final proposal, and it can either choose to keep the initial proposal as it is, 
or it can make any changes to the initial proposal and then adopt that as the final proposal. Uh, the final proposal is then um, also notified uh, and it is subject to um, appeals and objections. Appeals are open for anybody who made a submission on the initial proposal can make an appeal um, on the final proposal. If the final proposal is different from the initial proposal, that is, you make a change, um, then anybody can make an objection to um, the final proposal. And those appeals and objections are heard by the Local Government Commission, so they would automatically be referred to the Commission. Uh, they don't come back to the Council at that stage. Um, and then the, the Local Government Commission will make the final determination from there. Okay, thank you, Stephen. That was a very uh, good summation of the process and steps from here. Right. So, uh, so can, I, can I say one more thing? We've also got two briefing sessions booked in for each of the community boards. Okay, thank you. So we have a resolution. It's now open for debate. Uh, I've got Councillor Mayling, then Councillor McKenzie, then Councillor Kinn. Well, I, I can't support the resolution. I'm going to move an amendment, which I submitted to at least yesterday, which is 1A, which I don't think is perfect either, and, and it's one councillor in Golden Bay. But I believe at some stage we've got to address the issue of boundaries in um, the Mutri Waimea Ward, because that's the one that's really out of sync. And not, none of this is perfect. And I take account of the workload for councillors in Golden Bay, but it just depends what workload you choose to take on as a councillor. And I know that I've always asked the mayor for jobs because that's what I see as my role as a councillor. And I want to be involved in um, everything that happens in council except the transport committee, which drives me nuts. Um, having been on it in the past, because it's so frustrating working with Waika Kotaki, because um, nothing yet seems to get done. But I guess. I guess. I guess. So to me, your, your workload, um, is actually up to what councillors want to do and what they want to be involved in as part of representing their community. But just this option um, that was currently up is the soft option. It's doing nothing and it doesn't take into account the changes that have happened in our district in the last 18 years, which I think we should be taking into account. And the start is option 1A, because with the change in technology, you can no longer argue that Golden Bay is isolated. So I'm moving 1A as an amendment, option 1A, and I need a second. Yeah, a bit of second, but I'm waiting to be asked. <laughs> my hand is up. You know, I, I did note your hand up. <laughs> I, I did not necessarily go to all the hands up for seconders, but um, thank you for jumping in. Uh, so it has been seconded, so we're now debating the amendment. So effectively, the difference is, just for clarification, the reduction of uh, the number of councillors in Golden Bay. So that is now subject to the debate. I will come back uh, to the speaking order I had previously when we get back to the substantive resolution. Uh, in the meantime, put your hand up if you wish to speak to the uh, amendment. I'll start with Councillor Greening as he seconded, and then we've got Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Kinnamont, and Councillor Murray. So again, my starting preposition uh, is, first of all, I, I like Councillor Mailing, I can't support the principal resolution uh, uh, that the community don't expect any more councillors to be added to the pile. Uh, we are, um, in terms of a number of councillors, uh, similar to some very larger, much larger councils uh, who have even higher workloads. So um, the workload issue, I think, is a bit of red herring. Um, I do think um, that, uh, and again, this is my argument uh, for 3A really, was that by merging uh, the two regions, you'll get good representation and, and Golden Bay could easily uh, support getting a councillor under a merged arrangement. Um, what this proposal does is effectively kind of like 3A, it's kind of like a 2A really, which ensures there, there is at least one representative definitely from the Golden Bay region. Uh, or at least someone who is standing in the Golden Bay region. Um, and so that meets that desire. But I think, uh, I don't think, um, I mean, again, this is no reflection on the people involved. It's a mature conversation about the total number of governance required. And I don't think we require any more 
And what we've got, uh, we are adding a ward councillor, a Murray ward councillor, who, to be quite frank, will probably be also another, another advocate for Golden Bay and Mochawaka, because predominantly that's where most of the representation for Murray voters um, in the Tasman region tends to come from. So I think you're you're, you're not diminishing it. In fact, uh, your Murray Ward Council will probably jump in where you may have lost a Golden Bay representative, and they may well come from Golden Bay themselves. So um, I'm quite happy to support that on that basis. I think the representation, representation and coverage uh, is more than adequate. Um, personally, I prefer the merged um, approach, uh, um, but understand the argument for at least ensuring uh, an entrenchment of one representative. Um, so if this fails, I'll be obviously opposing uh, the main resolution uh, and maybe some reconsideration from some people around the table to support um, 3A, because this is effectively is a 2A option. Thank you. Right, there's a lot of A's being discussed. Uh, well, all the A's are 13 a, and all the B's are That's all good. Uh, so in terms of this resolution, uh, the, sorry, the amendment, I've got Mackenzie Kinamot maru um, and, and Butler. Thank you very much. Um, through the chair, before I speak to it, I guess I just want to make a point and then ask a question. Uh, the point I want to make is really just to, I guess, remind councillors that if we do add another councillor around the governance table, that doesn't come at a cost to ratepayers mm -hmm. because it actually just means that the pool of money that is allocated is actually uh, divided into bigger pieces of the pie. So an extra councillor doesn't come at an additional cost to ratepayers. Um, uh, my question is, I guess, and this might be a question for Leith or for Stephen, so if we go out with our, with our preferred proposal, what is our scope to make a large number of changes after we have gone through the consultation process? Or is our scope really limited to the changes that we could make after we've gone out with our proposal? Through the chair, I mean, like any changes to consultation material, uh, council will need to consider its significance and engagement policy in terms of changes and what additional consultation may be required. So if you were going to do a, a substantial change to the initial proposal, uh, it would be prudent to engage with the affected members of the community and potentially do some more engagement around what you're considering. I note there are some statutory timeframes uh, under legislation, so that consultation may be have to be truncated a bit, um, but it would definitely something we'd be looking at doing, depending on what changes you were considering. Okay, I think I'm sort of uh, 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 on that response, but understand it. Um, so, yeah, look, I can't support the amendment. Um, I actually, uh, I do think there is the isolation factor with respect to Golden Bay and uh, and whoever represents that Golden Bay ward, I mean, you know, I, I take my hat off. Their travel time is absolutely enormous. And uh, and I know that we have technology now, but, but sometimes actually, you know, that might not give the best result. And, uh, and I really just want to acknowledge, um, you add on the travel times that Councillor Hill has, talk, has talked about, that is completely different for other councillors that might have five minutes or half an hour or whatever the rest of us have. It, it is massive. Um, so I, I think they are uh, an isolated community. So in that respect, I can't support the amendment. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Kinnamont. Thank you, and through the Mayor. Um, well, I do actually support this um, uh, option 1A. Um, and I've got a question for Leith or Stephen here, is that reading the report here, we don't identify other people in the community who provide support through from the council through to our ratepayers, and that's our community boards. 
Is there any reason why the community boards do not get reflected in some of these figures? Is it just the councillors? Because the community boards are another form of getting our decisions, um, our work out into the community. So, yes, I agree going to one is going to change the dynamics, but we've also got other members in the, on the community board who supposedly act on our behalf. And so why aren't they reflected in some of these figures here? Uh, through the chair, I mean, I'll start and Stephen might finish this one. Um, the the table and the, the numbers that uh, you see there are, I understand, a requirement from LGNZ, uh, sorry, Local Government Commission, um, and reflect the elected members per, sorry, the councillors per population rather than elected members per population. I don't have an answer as to um, why there isn't a similar table for that takes into consideration community board members. Maybe Stephen might comment on that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lee. Um, uh, through the chair. Yeah, the uh, Act provides for the population per member ratios to be handled separately for uh, councillors elected in wards and for community boards. Now, if there, if there were to be subdivisions within a community board, then there would be a population per member table, which would appear also in these figures. But um, essentially, the community board numbers are considered separately to those for the elected councillors. But that doesn't preclude you as elected members making this decision from having in your own thinking and as part of your decision making the role that community boards play. So you can definitely factor that thinking into um, decisions that you make about what is the level of representation for those communities, um, how do you achieve effective representation, um, so that can certainly be part of your uh, discussion and thinking, but the the Act does not provide for those community board numbers to be uh, factored into that as a uh, determining factor. Okay, thank you. Uh, yep, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll, I'll come back, Councillor Kenamoth. I think you had a second question, Councillor Murray. That was not a second question, that's a follow on from that. So, with this information about the community boards and how active or inactive they are, how much they participate in the community, would that be reflected in anything that the council goes out to the community and consulting on this uh, proposal? Or is that something that we just ignore and let it run away? Or to, to me, I think it's quite important that our ratepayers know that there's a community board active in the community as well as the councillors. Through the chair, I, I think I understand your question, and please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. When we go out to, uh, with our initial proposal, it will be really clear this is what the council proposes. And these are the wards that currently have community boards in them, which the council is, um, is uh, going to, uh, so they're going to continue under this new proposal. So is, does that answer your question? You've done very well. Yes, thank you. Considering what uh, information I gave you, thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you, Councillor Murray. Thank you, Mr. Weir. I guess the first thing is um, the great part of this discussion is nobody can say that we make all our decisions in workshops but because the debate <laughs> has gone <laughs> gone very left and right. And I, and I just want to actually, I guess, acknowledge that the report in front of us is some thoughts and some indications from workshops from us that staff have compiled. So in, in terms of what we are sitting here re-debating again, and I guess we're playing around the edges, and I wanted to raise uh, what Councilor McKenzie raised, and that is, this doesn't have an increased cost on the ratepayers because the pool stays the same. This has uh, basically an offer to take a pay decrease from councillors to add some extra representation around this table. A and also for um, Councillor Hill in terms of it doesn't matter where you come from, that doesn't dictate workload. Um, and I take on, as well as your workload, the travel that the Gold Bay Council has had. So I won't be supporting this amendment. Um, I was a lot more interested in boundary changes and tweaks, and I remember us having discussions about Tasman could be in with Tasman could be out, but they didn't want to last time. 
Um, so this is a draft proposal, and I take in terms of depending how fundamentally we may change after submissions, but we are tweaking around the outside of drop one in Golden Bay, don't drop one. There's bigger issues to consider from the whole um, feedback process for this and submissions and LG, but like a government commission will ultimately decide, I think, because regardless of where we go, I suspect somebody's going to challenge this. But um, I just want to re-highlight that, you know, um, it's, it sounds really easy to take one away. Um, sometimes I've looked around the room and we've struggled for a quorum in this room with 13. So with 14, we might always have. And where the Māori ward comes from, as it was the mayor's position, that will be our ward at large. So it'll be across all of our district and certainly not just solely focused on Golden Bay and Motueka. So I didn't have any questions, but just acknowledging, Leith, that um, the report that you've put in front of us with the options reflects my understanding of feedback we've given you from this table. So um, just clarity around this hasn't been something that staff have just decided this is the best model. Uh, Councillor Butler. Thank you. Uh, yeah, from my dodgy internet today, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, this amendment reflects a familiar theme for remote rural communities. And it's interesting to hear that, um, you know, the rules, um, uh, that the situation with re regional council representation around the country that the mayor just spoke to. So um, this familiar theme is that remote rural areas um, are minimised and all government departments do this. Uh, so it's the fact that it's being, um, you know, reflected from um, urban to urban councillors is all part of the familiar pattern. So uh, that... Uh, these, um, this minimisation would result in Golden Bay having the highest population member ratio, so that he could, so that the one member in Golden Bay would be re representing the most number of people of all the councillors. Uh, just builds that picture of um, remote rural communities actually getting less, and that's really what we're talking about with this amendment. I could talk about other things, such as the fact that the, um, the proportion of the regional function of this council is um, is with rural the rural councillors rather than the urban councillors. And, um, you know, you could start to look at um, the proportionality there of that work. You know, Golden Bay's facing... Um, quite apart from the land and fresh water, um, you know, a possible gold mine looming with horrendous um, um, contamination and that type of thing. So, um, yeah, I probably don't need to say that I won't that I don't support the amendment, but I I think that there is there are there is this theme that um, I'd like council to reflect on of. Um, what remote rural communities do suffer from. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Butler. Uh, are there any more speakers to the amendment, noting that the amendment has been uh, moved and seconded? Move Councillor Mailing, seconded Councillor Greening. I will come back to Councillor Mailing should he wish to have a right of reply before putting the amendment. Just briefly, um, this has to be addressed at some stage, and this is a start. And I think boundaries is something that we need to address going forward. And I agree with Council Murray, uh, but this was what I thought I could do at the moment. We need to reflect what's changed in this district in the last 18 years. And the current proposal, the previous one, doesn't. This is some way towards it, but it's not all the way. So that's why I've moved this amendment. Uh, thank you, Council Mayling. Right, so everyone clear what the amendment entails? I will now... Put the amendment. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, nay. Uh, the resolution is lost. Um, we're now back to the substantive resolution, and I have a number of speakers. Uh, so Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Kennemont, and Councillor Greening are registered to speak, and so we'll work in that order, and obviously I'll take other people in, uh, should they wish to. Councillor McKenzie. Uh, thank you. I, I just have another question for Lethal, for Stephen. So... 
um, given where, where we're at in terms of our decision around the Māori ward and given where central government is at in terms of its bill and, and whatever, um, how many other councils in New Zealand find themselves in the situation that we find ourselves in? And would there be some kind of um, efficiency gain or something if we just basically did nothing until the legislation was passed? Uh, Heath and or Stephen. Through the chair. Uh, so just on that, we've received an update from the Liberal Government Commission. Uh, we did reach out and say what happens if we don't meet that 31 July deadline. And I'll just read their response. Um, under the legislation in place, if council doesn't meet the 31 July deadline to resolve its initial proposal, it'll be non-compliant with the Local Electoral Act. Decisions relating to representation may therefore need to go through an order and council process. Um, uh, provision of the extended deadline does not exist in the bill currently before Parliament. So that's the Māori representation bill. So uh, that suggests <laughs> if... That we should make a decision. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it strongly suggests we should make a decision. So the wet bus ticket is an order in council, is that? Slightly stiffer than a wet bus ticket, but more like a beaker. Okay. <laughs> All right, and the <laughs> and the and so just um, are we the only council in New Zealand that finds us, us ourselves in this position? Uh, through the chair, uh, no. A number of councils are grappling with this, and I understand that Stephen is assisting other councils who are in the same position as us. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Canamont, then Councillor Groening. Council Mackenzie asked both my questions, and I don't mind being hit with a B card. Uh, Councillor Groening. Yeah, so I mean, I can't support the resolution. I think um, the sensible approach is to either merge the wards or adjust the boundaries, which is option 3A, merge the wards, or option 2A, adjust the boundary. So um, I'll put 3A. Um, um, haven't got much support around the table for that initial uh, support. I do find the arguments about workloads and representation a bit of a misnomer when 3A would have also addressed that because you'd have three representatives for Golden Bay um, rather than two. But nevertheless, uh, that's the way people see things. Um, I, I can't support this. I don't think it's sensible. I think you need to address it. Um, there needs to be a mature conversation at the table. Uh, all I'm seeing is let's just hold the status quo. We don't really want to go here. Um, and I think that's uh, really um, an unfortunate position from a leadership group to, to, to address uh, and have a mature conversation. So um, I can't support this. I think it should be 3A and failing that 2A. So I'm again going to forewarn um, that if this resolution is lost, then I'll again put 3A and failing that 2A. Uh, which is the merger of uh, the two outlier Golden Bay in Mochuaca, which gets three representatives plus a Maori representative in Mochuaca, um, which gets the three and and um, and the Maori representative. So it's uh, more than coveraging uh, any workload. In fact, it, it involves a better spread of the workload rather than being confined to just the people in the ward. It certainly works much better for. Uh, uh, for um, Murchison as well. So I think that should be the more sensible approach. Um, and I'm, I'm disappointed that we're, we're not hearing that sensible approach. So I can't support this resolution and we're voting against it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. Other speakers in relation to the uh, resolution before us? Okay. Uh, again, bearing in mind it is the initial proposal. Uh, sorry, Councillor Dallin. Yeah, I'll finally step in. I'd like to say that um, I do think it's very important for people in the room, and I do think the Golden Bay need two councillors. Um, and I won't support the current resolution. I'm more towards to be. To be, or not to be, a oh, B card, wet bus ticket. Um, okay, anything further? Oh, I, again, I'll guess, I guess I'll reiterate the point. I've been through quite a lot of these. Um, and while the legislation is very much numbers driven, and that's what legislation does, and there's a reason for that, and the plus or minus 10%, 
Um, my recollection of the previous things is it actually isn't about the numbers. It's very much about people uh, and people's views and perspectives on where they best see themselves represented. And that doesn't always follow a rational numbers game. Oh, oh my goodness, I'm horrified that I'm slightly underrepresented in the Motueka Valley uh, statistically, but I actually don't feel like I'm part of Motueka, which was the conversation we had last time. Now, it will be interesting to see if there's a change in perspective in the community when we go out and consult. And I think the point that was made earlier, some people did take the time and effort to submit and um, provide their feedback to the initial um, request. Uh, and yes, there were relatively low numbers. It will be interesting to see the feedback we get now when it goes out as a formal proposal. Uh, and from my understanding, the scope to change uh, based on the feedback we get from the community is reasonably broad. Yes, it comes with some judgments to make down the track as to, to what extent, but if it is indeed the amendment of boundaries and shuffling where Wakefield sits or doesn't or whether it's Tasman moving into Motueka or I suspect that it's something we probably can change as part of submissions without having to reconsult, um, but would obviously then potentially be subject to objection uh, as we go down the track. So, um, whether it opens it up for objection and or appeal, I suspect either scenario is going to result unless we you know, come up with some magical solution that everyone's happy with. Um, at least one person or group you know, potentially taking it to the local government commission for determination, which is where we have been multiple times in the past. So I don't think we should be afraid about that outcome. Um, and lastly, I know, I know I actually do genuinely understand that you know, we should reflect on the changes that have been made but one of the feedbacks I get from communities is the amount of change, the constant change, the endless turning up or rearrangement of the deck chairs um, around whether that's central government policy or local government. Um, I think most people are um, not that keen to engage in yet another substantial reorganisation uh, of the deck chairs, uh, unless they can see a really fundamental change in their level of engagement, representation and influence um, in that change. I suspect most people will probably, unfortunately, be relatively ambivalent. Um, I'm sure there will be some very passionate advocates for one view or another. Uh, and uh, on that basis, look, I am happy to go out, support the resolution that's been made and then see what the community feedback is uh, during the formal submission process over the, the month. So that's me. I will uh, now look. Does the mover wish to have a right of reply? Uh, no, thank you. Mayor summed up very well. And I will now look to put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against. Against. No. Oh, oh my God, it's coming from everywhere. I'll do a show of hands. <laughs> uh, all those in all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. One, two, three, four, five, six. Was there an aye on the? Uh, Councillor Butler, seven. Uh, those against? Uh, one, two, three, Councillor Greening, four. Uh, and we have three not. So three apologies, Alan. So the resolution is carried. Right, I thank you. And we will now, I think that draws us to the conclusion of the agenda items. So I will uh, close with uh, Katakia. Kua mutu a mato mahi mo tene wa manakitia mato o mato ho o mato fano kato ao ki te aurangi etu mai ana korongo kerunga kia tina huie taikie.